Welcome to Smart Talk, where we speak with leading academics and other thoughtful persons on the important challenges facing the world today. My name is Edward Dodson. I am a longtime member of the faculty of the Henry George School of Science. Well, today we have the great pleasure of speaking with Dave Wetzel, a longtime activist working for social change uh, from his home in London. Uh, Dave has vast experience in the transport industry uh, from, and he'll give you a little bit more detail on that, going back uh, 60 years, I guess, Dave. And most importantly, from this standpoint of this conversation we're going to have with him is his experience uh, during the 2000s when he was vice president of Transport for London, a position that helped him uh, saw one of London's most serious problems, that was traffic congestion. And if we think about it, every city in the world today is dealing with the same sort of problem that Dave faced uh, in London when he took on that role. Uh, we have millions of people coming into cities every day in their automobile. We have cities that are working hard to try to figure out how to handle this traffic and the environmental consequences of so many automobiles on the street every day where they where they can park. And we have people on the highways going in and out of our cities, sitting there for sometimes hours waiting to get to their destinations. So these are all the issues I think Dave is going to tell us how he dealt with when he was working for London Transport. So Dave, uh, why don't you give the Smart Talk audience a little bit of your, your personal history, and then we'll talk about how you helped London deal with its congestion problem. Sure, Ed, good to see you. Um, I, I, I was a kid of 14 when uh, on my birthday, uh, I was hoping my dad was gonna give me a bike for my birthday. And uh, I was really disappointed because he gave me a book called Progress and Poverty, <laughs> written by Henry George. But uh, looking back over the years, um, that was the best present he could possibly have given me. Uh, within uh, six months of reading the book, um, I stood in a school mock general election uh, on a George's platform. And so since the age of 14, uh, I've been uh, advocating annual land value tax and the collection of economic rent uh, ever since. Uh, too many years to remember, really. In uh, When I was uh, 18, I became a school governor, uh, one of our local grammar schools. It, it was a girls' grammar school. I was quite keen that I should serve on a girls' grammar school governing body. And at uh, 21, I was elected to a local borough council. Our borough had a population that time of about 200,000 people. And uh, I was uh, on the left of the British Labour Party. And uh, I used to joke when I became chair of the Greater London Council's Transport Committee, I used to tell people, uh, I'm going to make mistakes in this job. Uh, because well, I have so much little experience. Before you in, before you uh, go on, I'd like to ask you whether or not your uh, familiar familiarity with uh, Henry George's work uh, as you were a young man growing up had any impact on your romantic life. Well, it's how did, how did the young it's women react? You to say that <laughs> I, I met. Uh, I, I had a part time job in the 70s, 1970s, uh, as a doorman on a uh, discotheque, uh, like a nightclub, um, called uh, Sergeant Peppers. And uh, they had a new waitress start. And I must have asked her out in the first week. I must have asked her out 100 times, and she said no uh, 100 times. And uh, one evening... <clears throat> Before the customers came in, about nine o'clock at night, and the customers used to start arriving after 10, I got the DJ to play some smoochy numbers and had a dance with this waitress. And uh, 
I started talking uh, politics to her and uh, <laughs> talking talking about land. And funny enough, she'd had a her own feeling that it was wrong. When you went into the countryside, you saw these notices, uh, trespassers will be prosecuted. And she used to think how wrong that was. But... Uh, I told her about, uh, I didn't mention Henry George, but I said that we should share the wealth uh, of land. Uh, and this was all while we're waltzing uh, around this empty dance floor together. And then I went to help her break the ice to put into the ice buckets for the champagne. And uh, while we were doing it, I said, I'm not going to ask you out again. I've asked you a hundred times. You've said no, but uh, I want us to be friends. So and colleagues, so I promise I'll never ask you out ever again. Um, she said, "Well, all right, I'll go out with you." And that was <laughs> my wife Heather. Uh, Seven months later, we were married. Um, I don't know if that's the best strategy to to offer to young men who might be listening in, but it's it's certainly an interesting way to establish a relationship with a young young woman. Anyway, I'm sorry I interrupted you giving uh, me more information about your uh, working life, Dave. So why don't you continue? Yeah, when I was um, elected to the Greater London Council's Transport Committee uh, with uh, Ken Livingstone as being our leader back in 1981, I, I used to go on the public platform and meetings and I used to tell people I'm going to make mistakes because although I was a councillor, for four years in Hounslow from 1964 when I was 21 till 1968. I was so far to the left of that Labour Party group that were in power, uh, they didn't even trust me to be vice chair of their burials committee. Uh, they were worried that I would go round the gravestones with a copy of Karl Marx and uh, try and rouse the dead into the revolution. <laughs> But, but uh, my career included being a bus conductor. I was a bus conductor at the age of 19. Mm. I was a bus driver. I was a pay clerk on the buses. And I was a garage inspector on the buses. I, uh, after that, I left and went to work for a, a transport company that uh, was a part of a laundry service. And we operated vans in uh, East London. Then I went to British Airways, which was BEA in those days, British European Airways. Um, but because we were only short flights, we used to say BEA stood for back every afternoon. But it <clears> merged <throat> with BOAC to become British Airways while I was there. And I was a shop steward uh, there. I then became a political organiser for the London Co-op, uh, the co-op is a business that's owned by the shoppers themselves, and uh, they put a part of the profits into education and a part of the profits into politics, and I was a political organiser. I did several things on transport campaigning with them, and in 1979, I stood as a candidate, Labour Party candidate, to become MP in Twickenham, but this was a very safe conservative seat. Uh, interestingly enough, mm. now it's a Lib Dem seat. Let me uh, ask you a question. How did, how did you get the Labour Party to support you for standing for election if they considered you to be even further to the left than they would have embraced? Well, that was um, not without difficulty, I would say. Um, but um, I used to, and still do, advocate a form of socialism, uh, which is uh, very close to syndicalism, uh, that uh, people, I don't mm. believe in the Bolshevik communist system whatsoever. Uh, I believe in democracy and people participating and people being given the tools and encouragement to participate. I believe in the arts and uh, having uh, a strong artistic life for people, uh, not just uh, painting, but theatre 
um, music, all, all forms of art. And so whenever I was making a speech at a selection conference, I used to say, why doesn't this town have a theatre? Uh, why don't we have a town orchestra? And uh, I broadened my politics way from the question of land and economics, which I included, uh, way from workers' control of industries, which I included, but uh, I tried to give people a, a broader view of, of political change. And uh, with some people, not everybody, I've never had a 100% uh, vote at a selection conference, but uh, fortunately with the majority, and I've now stood for elections, local government, regional government and national government about uh, 15 times in total. Um, so it, um, it I, I just try and express myself and let people judge me. Uh, you win some, you lose some. On this occasion, I, I was lucky. Um, they had had a right-wing candidate who went on to join the Conservatives later in life and um, he let them down uh, sort of uh, quite close within months of the general election. Uh, and so in one sense, they were desperate. Two, I lived fairly local, the next constituency. I already had a record for campaigning and working hard, uh, and it's what they wanted. They knew they couldn't win, but they wanted the arguments put across, uh, and that's what we did. One of the Question did, for you. For this is mostly for American audience uh, listeners. Uh, when you mentioned that you lived in the next constituency, is it is it my am I correct in my understanding that in standing for a seat in Parliament, you don't have to live in a the district that you run for? How does correct. that how does that work? Yeah. Well, you you have to be a citizen of the United Kingdom. You have right. to be on the ballot. Uh, you mustn't be a discharged bankrupt. Um, there's various conditions, but you can live anywhere in the UK uh, and uh, stand for Parliament. And uh, there are 650 MPs, so there were 650 constituencies. Um, the vast majority of those, uh, we operate on a first-past-the-post hmm. system, um, I would prefer proportional representation where every vote counts. But uh, with the first-past-the-post system, um, the majority of the seats, over half the seats, are safe seats. They don't change hands normally. Um, and so, therefore, it's the other seats, the marginal ones, where the real battles are to become a candidate and the real battles are mm. where the parties put most of their um, resources into winning. Uh, safe seats, they tend to just glide along. Safe Tory seats, so Labour candidates know they're going to lose. And uh, a safe Labour seat, Tories know they're going to lose. Funny enough, the last election, uh, 2019, when Boris Johnson got elected, there were some what were considered safe Labour seats uh, that voted for Boris Johnson. It was called the Red Wall. And uh, it was up north, and uh, there's about 20 or 30 of these seats which changed from Labour to Conservative. And in a nutshell, the real reason why that was, Labour was ambiguous about uh, membership of the EU, whereas Boris said, let's get it done, vote for me and I'll get us out. And uh, he, he the Tory vote was not split by... Um, the more right-wing party, uh, the Brexit party, standing against him in those seats, whereas they did stand against uh, Labour in Labour held seats. So they tended to split the uh, Labour vote and uh, unite the Tory vote. So mm. that's just a little bit of, of history, nothing to do with me. Although I am a Brexiteer myself, um, some people describe me as a Lexiteer, meaning uh, a left person to exit uh, the uh, common market and the EU. The main reason I oppose the EU is because they spend about 40% of their budget giving the money to rich landlords. They do it through the Common Agricultural Policy, 
And the more land you have, the more grant you get. And as we all know, that uh, <clears throat> government subsidies go into land values. And so it's a direct gift to the landowners. The farmer who rents their farm, their rent goes up. The uh, person who wants to buy a farm, the price of buying the firm, farm goes up. But the landowner who does no farming at all, they just sit back and collect the rent, uh, they, uh, they benefit. Uh, and that was so wrong to me uh, that we, I felt we had to come out the common market. Uh, and so I voted for Brexit. Um, having said that, the EU has some good things. And one of the good things, I can't imagine Italy, Germany and France all fighting each other in a, a third European war. Although I'm not happy about what's happening in the Ukraine. I think it's disgusting that the one country that has given up nuclear weapons voluntarily, the Ukraine, is now being attacked by Russia, whereas if they had kept those nuclear weapons, uh, Russia would not have dared attack. And uh, to me, that's a sorry story because uh, I support CND. I even carry a ring with the uh, CND symbol on it, my marriage ring, and uh, I'm very much in favour of disarmament across the world. Well, that would be a tremendous change in in the trend of history if that could happen. It seems, without getting off into a long tangent about what's going on in that part of the world, uh, it's hard for, for most of us to understand the motivation of Russia uh, in a in a in an era where territorial acquisition just seems to be um, a, 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 a no win policy. You know, what is, what is the reason for their, their desire to take on more territory occup, you know, with residents who don't want to be governed by, by, by that, you know, particular regime. This is a real, I don't know where it's going. I think we're all very concerned and afraid that the Russian leadership, is lost touch with the reality of the 21st century and that they have a mentality that seems to be going back to the 1800s. Um, I don't know what to expect, but it's certainly we're getting deeper and deeper into this with the, the, the tremendous financial implications, if not, you know, necessarily just the, the, the prospect of an expanded war, the United States, Britain, uh, Germany, other countries are spending billions and billions of additional uh, dollars or euro uh, to to support the Ukraine, and uh, I I don't know I I don't know where it's going. I'm fearful, and I, I guess most of the people who would be listening to this discussion would be also have the same opinion that this is a terrible uh, uh, outcome of of uh, geopolitics looking back uh, we didn't stand up to putin when uh, he took over other states uh, we didn't stand up to him when in what was it 2014 he started moving into the crimea and uh, it's a symptom of dictators uh, they they bite a finger and they get away with it so then they want the leg and then they want the whole body and uh, I think uh, we as a worldwide uh, movement need to stand up to dictators uh, and to promote democracy because uh, you know democracies make mistakes I think it was a huge mistake when uh, America and Great Britain under Tony Blair uh, went into Iraq. Uh, I think that was unforgivable, and it's really upset the Middle East totally. Um, but uh, hopefully we might learn from our mistakes. And certainly now I'm a member of the Green Party. I'm not a member of the Labour Party anymore, and uh, that invasion in Iraq was one of the reasons why I left Labour. Anyway, getting back to me, I've had wide experience in transport. I've been a minicab driver. Uh, as I said, I've uh, um, worked uh, rostering pilots for British Airways. I uh, was in, elected to the GLC, the Greater London Council, in 1981. And uh, to my 
horror almost. Um, I, I was elected chair of the transport committee. It's a long story how it happened. I wasn't expecting, I was expecting to, because of my trade union activity, to be vice chair of the staff committee. And uh, the person who was going to be chair of the transport committee stood down at the last minute. And by chance, really, I, I got elected. And yet, I've always had two loves in politics. Uh, my first love was land reform, and my second love is transport. Uh, and I come from a wide transport family. Almost every member of my family, my father, his brothers, my cousins, have all worked in transport over the years. Oh. So in 1981, we introduced a 32% cut in fares on the transit system in London. That's the London Underground trains and the London buses. And, of course, the result was people left their cars at home. There was 11% swing from cars to public transport. And there was a reduction in pollution, a reduction in road accidents and things of that nature. Was, um, but we were challenged by a Tory council. They took us to court. Uh, we won the first time in the High Court, but they won twice on appeal. And, Do you mean uh, you were the, the rate reductions were challenged? The fair, we reduced the fares, but to pay for it, we increased the rate, the property tax. I see. Okay. And, and one particular council <clears throat> uh, didn't have any underground trains. They had buses, but no underground trains. Um, and so they, uh, they're the ones that took us to court, a conservative council. And it was the law lords in the House of Lords uh, that judged that we had acted illegally. Uh, and I accused them at the time of being vandals in ermine because they were doing more to vandalise the transport system than any kid with a flick knife could do ripping up seats on a bus or on a train. And uh, we ran uh, a campaign against the uh, law lords and uh, unfortunately, the fares got doubled as a result. Another long story. I ended up in court because we ran a few of us ran a can't pay, won't pay campaign, giving our names and addresses on our own can't pay, won't pay tickets. And so 17 of us, about two and a half, three thousand people took part in the campaign. But 17 of us were prosecuted. And Heather and I both went to court. And uh, the first time in court, the judge or the magistrate um, accused me of behaving like an animal because I was interrupting him. And uh, so I did. <laughs> Imagine that. Gesture. So the second time I went before him, uh, I went to the uh, National Theatre. The GLC funded the National Theatre. And... Uh, Sir Peter Hall, some of people here may have remember the late Sir Peter Hall. He was running it at the time, and uh, he took me down to the props, and uh, I wanted a monkey suit I could wear, but it was actually turned out better. They gave me a ventriloquist dummy, which was about five foot tall, and so I took this dummy into court with me, and it sat beside me in the <laughs> court, and... Uh, yeah, we had a lot of fun one way and another. Um, I was describing to the magistrate, who kept asking me, did you on a certain day go through Oxford Circus Station and not pay your fare? And I was explaining the background, how we'd had meetings of co-ops, trade unions, labour parties to develop our uh, policies long before the election, how uh, we had a manifesto conference where the manifesto was written and that over a million Londoners voted for a manifesto said we would cut the fares. So what we were doing was implementing democracy. But anyway, uh, the law lords had decided we were outside the law on that because of the increase in the property tax. We didn't take into account, according to them, uh, the interests of property owners, and uh, they ignored all the benefits of transport. Uh, uh, happened because we reduced the fares and improved. We didn't just 
reduced the fares. We also improved the services. We put more trains on the underground. We put more buses on the buses, on the roads, and uh, we employed more staff. So we so, created more jobs and uh, lots of good things came out of it. But anyway, I was trying to what explain, level, at what like, level? you're like the magistrate. He kept interrupting me, you see. <laughs> and so he, he ended up storming off the bench because I was saying, as I was saying before, I was so rudely interrupted and he stormed off the bench. So I went up onto the bench, picked up his gavel, banged it on the desk and said, I declare all the can't pay, won't payers innocent. And there was a big cheer from the <laughs> uh, gallery. And it was in the press the next day. <laughs> it didn't stop him finding me. <laughs> I, my, my question is more serious. And that is, at what level of legislation would have been required for you to for for you to be able to shift the you know to 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 affect an increase in the property tax that people would pay you know did, what did you have to go through parliament to get a piece of legislation passed no that already happened i'm talking about what we were doing in 1981 in but i mean 19, you, you said let that, me finish i'll okay. answer your question okay in 1969 there was a Transport for London or of London um, Act in Parliament brought in by the Labour government that said they no longer wanted to run London transport, buses and underground as a nationalised industry. They were going to give it to the new, then new Greater London Council. And Dick Marsh, who was the Minister of Transport in the House of Commons, said that uh, under this act, if the GLC, the Greater London Council, wants to operate a free bus and underground service, they can, but they would have to reimburse London Transport from the fares that they collected. And in the act itself, it said we could give a grant to London Transport for any purpose. But within that act, it also said that we had to run the transport system economically. And, of course, by economically, they meant you don't have three buses all running together, the first one busy and the other two empty. You, you space them out and things like that. You don't throw money away. Uh, but that was what was meant in the Act. But the law lords interpreted that to mean that uh, GLC had to do everything practicable to make London transport run at a profit. And therefore, our lawyers said that we would have to increase the fares as a result of that ruling, that we would have to increase the fares periodically, regularly, until we reached the point of diminishing returns, where an extra penny in a fare brought in less revenue than previously. And of course, if you put the fares up, you bring the services down and people start using cars and other forms of transport. So uh, it was a nonsense judgment. Uh, we exposed it. Uh, friends of mine, I'm still friends with uh, now, um, dear friends of mine, uh, they got 50 people to make their own judges' costumes with wigs, uh, made out of carpets. They untwirled the carpet to make them into wigs with red cloth as a robe. And they put all this into carrier bags and 50 of them got on a bus in Highgate. And then when the conductor rang the bell, they put on the wigs, put on the robes, and they said, we're hijacking this bus to Westminster. And, uh, of course, when they got to Westminster, the press were there and uh, lots of publicity, uh, again, showing that the judges were fools in their judgment. Now, I had nothing to do with that, but I did have one interesting experience during this time, and that was when we were doing Can't Pay, Won't Pay. I was on a bus. I gave It was in uh, Piccadilly Circus, and uh, I gave the conductor my Can't Pay, Won't Pay ticket, and he refused to ring the bell. The bus was stationary at the stop. He wouldn't move. And uh, because he knew people, you 
I mean, he Bully, knew you personally. I wouldn't pay my fare. I was giving oh. him one of our tickets. Okay. So uh, he said, uh, so people were turning their heads, wondering what the heck's going on, why aren't we moving? So I stood up and I explained to them exactly what happened, the history and uh, why we were running the campaign. And uh, I took a vote. Uh, and uh, on the uh, downstairs of the bus, in the saloon, we call it, I, I got a majority that uh, I gave them the choice. I said I could step off the bus and you carry on with your journey or I stay on the bus and uh, we continue to protest. Uh, and the majority voted for me to stay on the bus. I then went upstairs where at that time the smokers sat and I did the same thing. Well, there were more upstairs and downstairs. And upstairs, they voted I should leave the bus. So <laughs> be, being a Democrat, I left the bus. But uh, here you are, democracy in action. Uh. But uh, after the, well, Mrs. Thatcher, obviously, uh, the Prime Minister of the day, uh, didn't like any of our policies. Uh, County Hall is diagonally across the River Thames from the Houses of Parliament. As when the MPs go out for their free drinks on the terrace, they can see County Hall across Westminster Bridge. And right up on the roof of County Hall, we had a number that changed every month. And it was the number of unemployed people in London. And we were blaming the MPs for that unemployment. And uh, that's just another example of the things that the GLC did when the miners came to London demonstrating during the miners' strike. We gave them free accommodation in County Hall. County Hall was really a, a stuffy place before we took over, and we opened it up. There were loads of meetings, some political, some not political, having free meetings mm. right in the heart of London in many of the rooms and the offices. My own office, I used to be allowed to be used as a crash on, on a Saturday for some of these meetings taking place. Uh, people brought their kids and, and they had nurses looking after the children while they were in their meetings. Now, and Dave. So it was a revolution what we were doing. Thatcher didn't like it, so she abolished us. And in 1986, um, April the 1st, we were abolished. And so I was out of work. That's when I became a minicab driver. But within a month, I was elected uh, deputy leader of Hounslow Council. I got elected onto the council, made deputy leader. And uh, a year later, I became leader of the council. And again, we introduced certainly Britain's, maybe Europe's, maybe the world's first scheduled wheelchair accessible bus so any person with a disability using a wheelchair could get onto the bus and it was a normal scheduled 20 minute service and uh, i'm very proud of that yet uh, today tfl have forgotten that uh, but that's another story a anyway, lot of good deeds are soon forgotten as as time <laughs> moves on I have a couple of questions based on some of what you've just talked about. One is that when the fares increased and the, and the ridership on on the uh, underground uh, fell and people started to drive in into the city in automobiles, didn't the cost of parking offset? I mean, more than offset what they would have had to pay to continue to use the underground? Or I, I mean, parking in... In American cities, in large American cities, is is an enormous expense. It used to be a planning requirement in London. If you built an office block, you had to build a multi-storey car park underneath in the basement. And, uh, of course, that then represented free parking for the workers that I see. drove in. But the workers that drove in weren't the cleaners and uh, the clerks and the secretaries. It was always the top bosses. Uh, that drove in and uh, what we found uh, was that uh, yes it, it uh, encouraged more people uh, and uh, to drive it uh, created more pollution uh, and it created uh, uh, more road accidents and it was very interesting transport planners loved what we did 
because they saw a 32% cut in fares and nobody knew prior to that what would happen if you cut fares by 32% and improved the services. And then they saw a doubling of fares and uh, a cutback on services. And again, nobody knew that. These drew, they, these planners were able to draw lines completely off their normal maps, their normal graphs. Uh, and so it gave them considerable uh, tools to play with in the future. But um, we, uh, Ken Livingston in 2000, uh, stood as an independent to be mayor of London. And uh, he stood as an independent because the Labour Party under Tony Blair gerrymandered the selection process so he couldn't possibly win the selection to be the Labour candidate. And most unusual for London politics, British politics, the independent won. And mm. uh, we even had Tories voting for Ken. We had millionaires making donations to his campaign. And mm. uh, he won the election. And... Uh, can I ask you a question about the politics at the time? Because earlier you had mentioned, you know, the election of Margaret Thatcher, uh, you know, as prime minister, and she brought in uh, a a much more uh, right wing sort of attitude towards housing. And uh, you you had at the time uh, extensive council housing that she worked to privatize to put people in home ownership. And I wondered by 2000, had that triggered a uh, an outcome that was unexpected? And that is a lot of foreclosures and evictions. And was there a rising homelessness problem in the country as a result of, you know, the Thatcher experiment? Definitely the answer to that is yes, uh, but not directly um, just because of the... Uh, what we call right to buy. It gave residents yeah. of uh, council property the right to buy their property at a discounted price. So they would be paying <laughs> perhaps 30 40% of the value of the property to buy it. And uh, so yeah. that meant that as people became homeless, there wasn't the housing stock. I used to live in a council flat in Windsor. When Heather and I first got married, uh, we lived in a council flat in Windsor, but we left that flat to buy our own house. But uh, people not having to leave buying their council property, it took it out of the um, um, public rental market. So, And also they weren't building new houses and new homes, so the stock reduced and ironically, today, a good proportion of those houses that were sold to their tenants, the tenants in turn sold them on to right to buy landlords mm -hmm. and a right to rent landlords. And so many of those same properties are still being let out today. But instead of a social rent, a limited rent, they're market rents. So people are renting those same properties cheek by jowl with other rented properties that are still council, but uh, they're having to pay a high rent to a private landlord instead of a low rent to the local authority. So that policy really was a disaster. But to his shame, Tony Blair continued with that policy. My party, the Green Party, wants to stop right to buy. It still exists today. Uh, and my party wants to stop the right to buy. And we. You mean there are still there are still some council uh, council uh, properties in every every community that not all of them have been sold to their occupants, their rental occupants. Oh, the majority stayed as rent is. They even with a discount, oh, they couldn't, really? uh, couldn't afford the mortgage. So I see. Most people didn't do it. But I, I don't know what the proportion is. I could Google now and find out. I, I Top of my head, I, I would guess, thinking of the estates where I've knocked on doors canvassing, I, I would say, and, and you can usually tell, 
the people that bought their own home. They put a new door so their door doesn't look the same as everybody else's, and they put two lions mm. on the gate. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it identifies them as, I own this property, it's mine. Um, but uh, I would imagine about a quarter uh, of the housing stock was lost. But what is even worse is new homes have not been built. So where new homes are being built, they're being built for sale, uh, not on the whole being built for rent. Uh, and we do need more premises for people to rent, particularly when you start married life and all the bills are coming in. Over time, you can afford then to buy a property and uh, get on the so-called housing ladder. Have you well, heard it, of the housing ladder? Of course, yeah. Right. Well, I want a second-hand car ladder. Mm. I buy my second-hand cars for about £2,000, and I want to sell them for £25,000. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to having a second-hand car ladder. And I use that as an example to people. It isn't a housing ladder. It's a land ladder. Yeah, of it's course. It's the land value that goes up, not the house value. Yeah, I... In my own writing on, on the similar issues, I always try to remind people that a housing unit is a depreciating asset. I mean, every yeah. year you own a house, you're spending money to maintain it. And about every decade or so, you have to spend a huge amount of money to replace all the systems that have worn out. So, you know, when you go to get a loan from your mortgage lender, usually they give you a maximum of 30 year loan because that's the anticipated life of your house. It's by after 30 years, it's depreciated down to nothing unless you spent an, an, a, a, an unusually large amount of money to upgrade it, modernize it, et cetera. So people don't really get that. Uh, the point you've made that the increase in property value comes from the increase in land, not not from the increase in the housing unit you, you've, you've purchased. Um, that's a real well, educational I problem. I, I wonder... You know, your experience now that you're in the Green Party, is there a greater appreciation for that, you know, aspect of how the economy works than existed when, when you were with Labour? Oh, yeah. we. The Green Party's policy is for annual land value tax. No question Great. about that. <clears throat> um, and uh, but there's still. A measure of ignorance. Uh, but uh, I'm not here to criticise Green Party well, members, but uh, they all need to read their Henry George, and unfortunately uh, not many young people want to do that these days. What about land trusts? Is the Green Party a proponent of forming community land trusts to try to establish permanently affordable housing? I can't speak for the Green Party in the UK, but um, or in England and Wales, because... Uh, we have uh, uh, three Green Parties in the UK, one for Scotland, one for Northern uh. Ireland, uh, and one for England and Wales. But I can't speak for them. But uh, certainly, uh, personally, I support land trusts. Um, I, I was staying with a uh, colleague in, in uh, Melbourne, just outside Melbourne in Australia uh, last year, uh, and he's devoting 27 acres to create a, a land trust. That's Carl uh, Fitzgerald? Exactly. Yeah. And uh, I, I spent, uh, several, Heather and I spent uh, about five, six days with him and his family in the middle of winter because their August weather is uh, winter time. And uh, it, it's matching what he's trying to achieve. But... Um, I encourage uh, land trusts, but they're not the answer. They're not the solution. It needs a broader solution. Because in our country, people who want land trusts, they have to buy the land. And they're buying the land at a high price. Well, if we had an annual land value tax, or in some way we collected the land rent for public purposes, the purchase price of land would be low. So with the same amount of money, you could have bigger wider right, right. land trusts. Uh, and I try and edu educate those people about the ideas of Henry George, uh, often without actually mentioning Henry George by name. But uh, 
Well, let's I get back to your, your experience we working for anybody looking at the land question. Let's get back to your experience working for Ken Livingston and 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 how that progressed to deal with the uh, automobile traffic and coming to congestion pricing in London. The very first meeting I had with Ken <clears throat> when he became mayor and I was already then appointed as vice chair of transport for London. He said to me, my prime <clears throat> objective is to get the congestion charge introduced in two years. And uh, that was uh, two, year 2000. And uh, that's what we at TFL set about doing. Uh, first of all, we needed to create a team of professionals uh, to do the work. We then had to let out a contract uh, for somebody to implement the policies. And uh, what we decided, first of all, we wanted a team not of the usual local government bureaucratic mindset that comes to you and says, you can't do that because you've got a problem. You can't do this because there's a problem. We wanted a team of people who had the mindset that came to us and said, we can't do it that way because there's a problem. But you've got three choices. You could do it this way, that way, or another way. Uh, and uh, we were lucky. Uh, we chose such a team. We got them operating uh, under good leadership, good uh, uh, leadership both political from Ken and, uh, dare I say, myself, but also leadership of the senior officer we appointed and the people immediately reporting to him. Uh, they were all very, very good. And uh, with their advice, we decided that uh, we wouldn't do separate contracts. Uh, we wouldn't do a, sub a contract for the cameras. Uh, we wouldn't do a contract uh, for the computer system. Uh, we wouldn't do a contract for the call, call, call system. Um, so we decided we would have one company responsible for all these things. Hmm. And they would let out the individual contracts to their choosing. So the, if things went wrong, we only needed to pull the beard of one person. We couldn't have one person say, oh, well, it's not our fault, it's the cameras. And the camera people say, it's not our fault, it's the call centre. And the call centre say, it's not our fault, it's mm -hmm. the computer. <laughs> uh, we were very keen, that, it, but it was expensive. Mm. And the reason it was expensive was twofold. Uh, the main reason was it was an unknown risk. They didn't know how many people would pay the uh, charge to come into London. Supposing nobody paid the charge, if they all gave up their cars and they all came in by bus and train, bicycle and walking, in that case, their revenue would have been zero. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if loads of people paid the charge, the revenue would be higher. And more important still, if loads of people didn't bother to pay the charge, but received a penalty. So instead of paying £5 a day, uh, they were having to pay £60 or £70, pounds, then the revenue would be higher still. But this was all unknown. And so what do private companies do uh, when the risks are unknown? They put it in the price of the contract. And uh, we didn't actually go for the best performers. The best performers were even more expensive than the second best who, who we chose to do the job. Uh, they weren't cheap, but they were less expensive than the most expensive. But um, it took time to introduce. Uh, we did have hiccups. Uh, one of the hiccups was when we appointed an American, Bob Kiley, as our transport commissioner in January 2001. One of the first things he did was to stop the work on the congestion charge while his team of Americans examined to make sure we were going down the right road. And that was an unnecessary delay. Unfortunately, Bob Kiley is uh, 
uh, dead now. But I had a lot of respect for him. But that was one mistake he he made. Uh, how uh, how was it that an American group of Americans was chosen to oversee this whole process? It it seems uh, highly unlikely. But how did that occur? We inherited the offices of London Transport, the managing directors of the buses, managing director of the underground. They had been quite hostile to us during the election campaign, and they have been running London Transport badly. And uh, Ken made it quite clear in his public announcements uh, that he thought they were idiots, etc., etc. <clears throat> and so... When we created this new organisation, which was to incorporate transport for London, but uh, incorporate London transport, the buses and the underground, but also incorporating lots of other things, we brought together 16 different transport functions, um, licensing of taxis, licensing of minicaps, giving grants to borough councils, um, for initiatives, transport initiatives in their own local areas, um, giving, uh, taking over the Croydon tram, taking over the Docklands Light Railway, something that we built in the days of the GLC. We're partners, but uh, in days of the GLC, we promoted it. I dug the first bit of dirt for the first bit of track of the Docklands Light Railway. And uh, so we had, took over road safety, uh, all the traffic lights in London, mm. um, all <clears throat> the red routes, which were the main uh, highways in London, except for motorways, which stayed with government. But there's not many motorways within London. They mainly come to London. And uh, so we had to incorporate 16 organisations and uh, Ken was keen that we should scale the world for the best person to operate that, to be the commissioner. It was a new title. You know, it's an American title. You have fire commissioners and transport commissioners. It's, uh, we'd never had that in the uh, UK before. But Ken created this title of transport commissioner for London. And uh, it was ironic that uh, the headhunters were uh, headhunting uh, a guy in America who <clears throat> quoted Bob Riley, Bob Kiley, as his referee. So the headhunter rang Bob Kiley and said, I'm headhunting for this job. Joe Bloggs has been uh, suggested. We've interviewed him. And he's given you as a reference. Uh, and Bob Kiley said, well, send me the details. And uh, a few days later, he rang them back and said, I wouldn't mind applying myself. <laughs> and uh, But uh, we uh -huh. were thinking of paying somebody, we said, a six-figure sum. So a six-figure sum could have been £101,000. We were thinking on lines of maybe £200,000 for this job, uh, which was more than the head of the underground or head of the buses was already getting paid. And uh, we interviewed Bob Kiley while he was in New York and we were in a basement in Ken's office in London. And there was this great big long um, boardroom table with our camera at one end and Bob Kiley at the other end, a little tiny dot. And... Uh, we're all sitting with the headhunter, uh, and I said to the headhunter, can you ring New York and ask them to <clears throat> zoom the camera in? I can't see this man. Now, I learned later from Bob himself, it wasn't coincidence. Because of his age, he was over 60, he didn't want the camera close on him. <laughs> it was a deliberate ploy on his part. But uh, he was afraid he might be discriminated against because of his age. Correct. So <laughs> the, the guy I spoke uh -oh. to in our room in the basement, he didn't have to ring New York. He had a control himself and he could control it through the broadband 
And suddenly we zoomed in on, on Bob Kiley. Anyway, as a result of that interview, the following weekend, Bob came for a weekend in London with his wife. And we interviewed him in uh, the Grosvenor Hotel in uh, Park Lane. <clears throat> and it's the most peculiar interview I've ever taken part in. Because, to be truthful, we were not interviewing him. He was interviewing us. Yeah. He ascertained that because of the government's plans for a part privatisation of the Duke, we would be in conflict with the underground. And he wanted to be sure that Ken and the board, it wasn't the full board, we had a um, just a small subcommittee of the board doing the appointment, but he wanted to be sure that we were up for the fight. So he was asking us questions. Yeah, we're sitting there sipping champagne and having sandwiches, and uh, this bloke is uh, interrogating us whether we're good enough to be his employers. And uh, the only uh, snag in it all was that uh, when uh, we come to the salary um, about a week later, and Bob was told he'd get, oh, he asked for the same oh. salary he was getting in New York. Uh, and we agreed to that. It was about 300, 350,000 pounds. But when his accountant looked at the local tax here in London, not the local, the UK tax compared to the American tax, he realised Bob was going to be way out of pocket. So we ended up paying him the 350 plus a bonus that took his salary, his gross salary, £700,000. Oh, my goodness. And he then was the highest paid public official in the UK. And it was very, very controversial. I'm uh, sure it was. <laughs> lots of socialists uh, uh, objected, but <clears throat> we stuck to it and we appointed him and it was a good appointment. Uh, no question about it. And uh, Bob had his problems. Um, and uh, at the end, it was a fractious parting of the waves. But uh, he, he served us well until uh, he left us and... Uh, uh, I'm grateful to Bob Kiley. And he wasn't the first American to run the London Underground. Mm. There have been two others before him. Uh, and one of those, uh, I can't remember mm. their names and the exact details, but one, I think, was a bankrupt uh, who uh, bankrupted himself and others running the uh, underground system in uh, New York. And uh, he then uh, bankrupted the London Underground. But uh, that was back in the uh, 19th century. But so Bob was the third American to run the London Underground. Uh, and as I say, he did a good job because he didn't come alone. He made sure that he had a team of people that would come with him. And before he said yes to us, he put all those ducks in a row. Uh, and uh, that's what happened. So we ended up with an American running the Underground. We ended up with an American... Uh, as our chief of staff, um, doing all the finance and all that side, uh, chief executive officer, really. Uh, so that's how it worked. And Bob really operated uh, like a chairman rather than as a uh, chief exec himself. He, he was more like a, uh, a pinier chairman. And, and let me tell you, it's not a secret, because if you look at Land and Liberty going back uh, to uh, 2001, 2002, mm -hmm. You'll see an interview with Bob Kiley where he said that land value tax should be in the UK Chancellor's toolbox. He he wasn't a George's. He didn't see it like us as the be all and end all. But he said it should be one of the economic tools that a Chancellor of the Exchequer, the finance uh, minister for the UK, should have in his toolbox. Uh, and, of course... Uh, I welcome that, and uh, it was very helpful to me uh, that Bob was on side with us on land value tax. I, just to interrupt and let let some listeners who may not be familiar with Land and Liberty, Land and Liberty is a longtime publication of the Henry George Foundation of Great Britain, and uh, you can access archived editions of Land and Liberty online at the foundation's website. 
Yeah, I think it's been going since 1884 or some ridiculous date in the 19th century. That was first, its name was first Land Values. And then it changed, I forget what year, to Land <clears throat> to land and Liberty. But I think it's a delightful title. Yeah. So the results of, of Mr. Kiley's arrival uh, changed the whole structure of how how uh, London transport was funded as well as operated. And so what, how long did it take for the results of congestion pricing to start to make themselves, make itself felt so that people understood that this was the right policy to pursue? From day one of its implementation, right up till then, um, loads of people, were against it, transport experts, um, <clears throat> journalists. It didn't matter what page you read in the national newspapers. And remember, this was only London. You know, we're not uh, a national government. We're only the government for the capital city. But uh, if you read the gardening page, um, the uh, journalists would be saying, how possible will it be for me to get to my garden centre uh, once you got this congestion charge. If you read the uh, transport page, they'd be against it. If you read the uh, city page, they'd be saying the city will die on its feet when people can't get into London by car. Um, it didn't matter what page you read, even the women's page. Um, how, how will I be able to take my child to nursery by car uh, when there's this terrible congestion charge? But one of the good things we did was to consult. We didn't consult on the principle. Ken Livingston made it absolutely clear that when Londoners voted for him to become mayor, they voted for the congestion charge. He was the only candidate that said he was going to introduce the congestion charge. And uh, so what? So he Ken had a said, mandate when he was elected. Exactly. So what Ken said was, mm -hmm. I'll consult you on the detail. So I'm not asking you, shall we have it or shall we not have it? But what sort of system shall we have? What hours of the day should we have it operating? Um, what charge should we charge? Should we have a differential charge? Should we charge lorries more than the cars? Or should we charge commercial vehicles? the same or even less uh what do we do about weekends do we include them do we exclude them uh what about mm -hmm. the ring road we're going to have a ring road around london that you can drive on without paying but as soon as you leave that ring road and come into central london then you will start paying where shall we have that ring road what about exemptions should we give exemptions to firefighters to ambulance workers uh, to all emergency workers, should we give uh, uh, exemption to uh, school teachers and other public servants? Should we uh, give exemptions to residents who are living within the zone? So all these factors that we had to make decisions on went out for consultation. We said what we were planning, and then they were able to amend it. And... Uh, it wasn't by accident it was a good scheme. It was because we consulted with real, what I call genuine consultation. It wasn't a rubber stamp exercise just to get it through and get it on the uh, statute book and operating. We generally wanted to hear what people had to say and we generally took steps and measures to try and ameliorate the problems that they create. I went to almost hundreds of meetings. Um, workers at Covent Garden, they work three o'clock in the morning till nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, they could have driven into work without paying it, but driving home again, they would have to pay it. Why, uh, why would so, they have to pay going out of the city? Because any vehicle operating within the zone oh. have to pay it. So it didn't matter what direction you were driving. Ah. If you're driving within the zone, it wasn't you paid to cross the border. No. Any vehicle within the zone had to pay it. So if your vehicle was parked overnight in the zone 
And after seven in the morning, you drove it, you had to pay. So we, as it happened, we didn't make any changes for that particular grouping. But that's just an example of the sort of people I met, midwives, all sorts of groups uh, of people that uh, were claiming exemption or residents. Some residents outside the zone wanted to come into the zone because we were only charging 10% for residents within the zone, whereas being just outside the zone, if you drove in, you had to pay 100%. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, we improved the system. It was better than it would have been if we just relied on ourselves. We relied on all of Londoners to improve the system. And uh, But everybody, uh, Tony Blair, the Prime Minister, was saying... This congestion charge is madcap idea of Ken Livingston, thinking it was going to go haywire and go wrong. Um, he was disassociating himself, although he'd passed the legislation that created the uh, mayoral office and gave the mayor the powers, and indeed his government gave the mayor the money to create the congestion charge because it was very expensive to create. You had to have all these cameras all over London. Mm -hmm. Every road, every small road coming into the zone had to have a camera. So it was very expensive. And we had no revenue coming in uh, from the cars until it operated. So all that expense of setting it up, the computers, the call centres, all that expense the government paid for, for us. But anyway, the government disassociated themselves. They thought it was, the opposition thought it was going to be a disaster. And uh, so we were perhaps on tenterhooks on uh, February the 17th, uh, 2003, uh, a bit mm -hmm. late. We were supposed to bring it in in 2002, but it was delayed. We brought it in at the beginning of a school holiday, half term in February. Um we cancelled all non-emergency roadworks for a week leading up and three weeks after. For a whole month, there were no non-emergency roadworks in London because just general roadworks maintenance causes delay. Um, so we and because we did it on the school holiday because traffic is down fifteen percent in the peak period during school holidays, because mums and dads are not taking their kids to school. Teachers aren't driving to school. A lot of city workers who drive in during the school holiday will be um, down in Spain having a week's sunshine, uh, not driving into London during that week. So the traffic is naturally down. So we gave ourselves the best possible wind we could behind the introduction. But nevertheless, Steve Norris, who had stood against Ken, Ken as mayor of London for the Tories, had a band of Tory supporters at uh, one of the ring roads um, with their banners waiting for seven o'clock in the morning. The uh, We were told the ring road would become congested and all the roads leading into London would be congested. And... Uh, at seven o'clock that morning on the television, uh, they had a camera on Tower Bridge. That's the bridge that opens. The, the Tories and... did. <laughs> the Tories <laughs> had this camera. No, no. BBC. Oh, BBC. Sky Television. Okay. All the broadcasters oh, had okay. cameras out seven o'clock that morning on their breakfast shows, waiting for this disaster to happen. Uh, I was in my office and I had TV there and uh, I, I waited for seven o'clock countdown and then it happened and I'm looking at this picture of Tower Bridge and one car came across and I'm waiting and then another car came across and you wait a little bit longer and then a <laughs> lorry comes across. It, it was a success. <laughs> from day one, a huge success. Uh, but, of course, there were silly little problems. Um, a farmer who had a tractor uh, registered with a registration number, but 
he, he never left his local village up in the countryside somewhere, never came within 100 miles of London. He got a congestion charge ticket. Yeah, it was obviously a mistake. Somebody entered in the wrong number or something. Uh, um, there uh. was a Rolls Royce sitting in a museum. I think it was in uh. Leeds. Uh, and they got a congestion uh, charge uh, ticket. It never left the museum. Uh, again, uh, a mistake. The trouble with British licensing, zero and noughts um, uh, are both used. So if somebody writes a nought in, instead of a zero or a zero instead of a nought on their number plate uh, or, or the typing person types it in wrongly, uh, then uh, if the charge is not paid, uh, then uh, they get a ticket. Right. So the press love those silly little mistakes. But everybody from day one said it was a huge success. The amount of traffic coming into London reduced. We were able to give that extra time, not to cars, so you can make quicker journeys. We put in more cycle lanes. We put in more bus lanes. We retime the traffic lights so that pedestrians have more time to cross the road. We gave the time back to the environmental travellers, not to the car travellers. We were criticised for that because the car travellers said, well, we're paying for a quicker journey. We're not getting it. We said, no, you're not paying for a quicker journey. And uh, your journey is the same. It's still congested, but we're making sure. And for the buses... Um, we had to retime the buses because they were com <clears throat> competing their journeys so quickly. <clears throat> we were able to operate more buses on the same shift of drivers because uh, they could do more mileage with the congestion charge in place. And uh, now, since then, uh, Boris got elected. Uh, he never abolished it. He kept it. And uh, so on and so forth. So, uh, well, uh, today it's still there and now on top of congestion charge um, hmm. the Labour Mayor uh, has introduced a low emission zone and an ultra low emission zone so that now for from August uh, this year every car in London will have to be a clean car the definition is set by the Mayor but if it's a dirty car then you have to pay for the low emission. Well, these sound all like great best practices that should be emulated elsewhere around the world. So the, the next logical question I have for you is what has been the level of interest and attention by people from other cities, not just in England and Wales and Scotland, but in the EU and elsewhere, I mean, have they looked at what London did during this period and, and what's continued to happen? And is it starting to, has it had any ripple effect? Ripple effect in terms of implementation, perhaps not. I know Stockholm has a congestion charge and Singapore had one before us, uh, which is different to ours. But um, ours could be better. Um, but answer, and I'll go into some detail if you want me to, how we could improve it. But um, in terms of interest, huge, massive interest. We almost had a whole public relations department dealing with all the inquiries and visitors and requests for speakers coming in from around the world. I, I myself on congestions charging uh, have spoken in many cities in the uh, united states um in china uh in the middle east in africa in europe uh huge huge interest and i did that while i was working for tfl and i continued doing that uh, after i retired and uh, became a consultant and uh spoke on all those continents. Um, I never talk about congestion charge without mentioning land value tax. Yeah. And uh, I say that really congestion charge is a land value tax on wheels. And if you want to know about land value tax, then and then I usually have a 10-minute little spiel uh, about 
funding transport from land values. We tried to do that. Well, way back in 1981, I mentioned I, I was the midwife to the Docklands Light Railway, and I wanted us to buy the GLC, to buy all the land around the stations before we announced the stations so that we could enjoy the uplift. But we didn't have the legal powers to compulsory purchase for that reason. If we needed it to build a station or to build a railway, we had the compulsory purchase powers, but not to speculate. Well, Dave, and, uh, I, I was just going to say uh, before I forget, um, Smart Talk reaches a fairly large audience. If there are some some uh, urban planners out there who might see this, um, would you be willing to have them contact you uh, for? Oh, absolutely! Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If uh, if the school gets any inquiries, we'll pass them on to you directly. Bef before we end this conversation, which has been a, an amazing conversation, uh, it almost it almost would be a rough draft for your memoirs, my friend. So you might consider putting this down in writing for for a wider audience at some point. It's, it's a it's a remarkable story that you've told us today. I was just reminded. When you were talking about, you know, the ability to the, the difficulty of acquiring land that, that back in the early 1900s, an American did come to Britain and try to uh, purchase a good deal of British land to help uh, unemployed people find a new way to support themselves. And that was Joseph Fells. Are you familiar with that story? I know the name. I don't know the yeah. story. Yeah, it's, it's something uh, that. I, I did a lecture on on Joseph Fells and his life, and he became a British citizen and he funded the acquisition of a lot of vacant land, rural land, where they constructed housing and brought in unemployed people uh, to come in and basically create new communities. And there are a number of these communities that I gather uh, they may have changed in their structure, but are still in existence throughout throughout England. But that's that's something I put to you to take a look at to see if it still exists. So well, we we have the Garden City movement, um, but the trouble is these days people only talk about garden cities in terms of good architecture and good town planning. But it also um, require. I'm trying to remember the man, and it escapes me the name yeah. of the man that um, initiated uh, the Garden Cities. But he was a devotee of Henry George and um, he insisted that the rent of land should be collected within the garden city should be collected centrally and uh, within the city and then they should use it to pay for parks libraries uh, and other education other facilities so Tories that talk about garden cities don't realize it's a three-legged stool, not a two-legged stool. But there's one story I do need to uh, tell you, which is very relevant. It arises from Bob Kiley. With Bob Kiley, we went to the Treasury here in the UK uh, to ask for permission. When we built Crossrail to collect the land value around the line that Crossrail was going to create, you know, and um, we were using examples, Don Riley, Jubilee Line Extension, having cost three and a half billion to build, but actually raising land values by 13 billion. All documented in uh, uh, Riley's book, uh, Don Riley's book, Taken for a Ride. Right. And he's not referring to passengers taken for a ride. He's referring to taxpayers taken for a ride because taxpayers paid the three and a half million billion and the landowners got the 13 billion. So on the strength of that, we were saying Crossrail, we want to uh, levy a land value tax to pay for Crossrail. And the government wouldn't let us. But Bob Kiley's American team looked at the rating system the business rates in the uk and they said how about allowing us to put a small percentage on the london business rates 
for the very expensive buildings. They're buildings that have a rateable value of £50,000 a year or more. I think specifically it was 49000 So that would be the tall offices and what have you, very valuable properties, big business. And the Treasury said, how much would you collect? Uh, and at that time, the cost of Crossrail, now called the Elizabeth Line, was 16 billion. And we thought we could raise 4 billion by this levy. And that was the game changer that allowed the Treasury to say yes. And that levy is still being paid today to pay for the Elizabeth Line. And the Elizabeth Line only started operating last year. But uh, ever since about 2007, I think, uh, that levy has applied. And uh, it, it was without any confrontation whatsoever. It uh, The people paying, owning the properties, knew that their land value was going to go up by more per annum than the business rate uh, increase. And so, therefore... I won't exactly say they were happy to pay it, but uh, they were prepared to pay it because without it, Crossrail wouldn't have been built. Uh, and that arose because Bob Kiley uh, understood land rent and he and I and others, uh, including the mayor, Ken Livingston, argued for it with government uh, and the Labour government conceded it. And when the Tory government came in, they didn't drop it. They continued with it. Was this additional revenue used to pay off the bond bonds? Were the the bond were the bonds issued to pay, it? and so the revenue was was used to pay the interest on the bonds and pay down the the uh, actual capital value of the bonds. As far as I know, it went straight into revenue to pay for the building across oh, Rail, but Okay, I, I could be corrected on that. I'm not a finance expert. Well, Dave, this has been a really great conversation. I thank you for taking the time to to join uh, join us here at the Henry George School to share your experiences, and uh, I hope it reaches a, a large audience. Um, there's a lot for people to think about, and uh, as I said, I I hope you'll continue to to work on these important issues in your retirement, and we look forward to eventually having you come visit again to the United States. I said I come from a transport family. In 1926, my dad was a bus conductor on one of these type of buses. <laughs> and uh, that shows you how long my family has been involved in uh, transport. And uh, his brother, my uncle, was a driver of one of these buses. Uh, and he started even before me dad. <laughs> and now is that extended to the younger generations in your family? Well, it's interesting you say that. I uh, had a son of a nephew um, email me a month ago, and he said, uh, you'll be interested to know I'm, fa I'm continuing the family tradition. Um, he, he's got a degree, and um, he, he's... Um, speaks Russian, he's lived in Russia for five years, but he teaches now in this country and he's given up his teacher's job because of the stress and he's uh, going to run a consultation department within TFL, Transport for London, for uh, operating, uh, um, I was going to say safe, but environmental routes to school, encouraging the walking bus where kids hold hands and walk to school together, yeah. cycling to school and all that. So the answer to your question is yes. Um, my young uh, nephew, Robert, uh, or my nephew's son, Robert, is now uh, working for Transport for London. Well, I hope that legacy continues and... Uh... Uh, hopefully, hopefully they'll have the same sort of success in impacting, uh, you know, what's going on in in London and, and London transport that you've had. Um, well, for those who have listened, I hope you've uh, enjoyed our conversation, and I thank you very much, Dave, for your time. Well, that that's it for this edition of Smart Talk. 
for more information on this and other episodes, please visit our website, henrygeorgeschool.org. Again, I am Edward Dodson, and thanks for watching Smart Talk.